Have you ever noticed that the way you start out your day seems to predict how the rest of your day will go? I'm reminded of a lady who started her morning out with a prayer, Dear Lord, things are going pretty well today. Nothing in my body hurts. I haven't gotten into an argument with anyone in my family. I haven't failed to fulfill any of my promises, and I haven't been late for any appointments. But Lord, I'm just about to get out of bed, so please help me. Things in today's culture, in the world around us, are so uncertain. Anxieties lurk around every corner. Just getting on the roads in the morning to drive our car can cause anxiety for many of us. Not knowing what is going to happen on the road or where we are going. And from the raising of your hands during the children's sermon, I can tell many of you are anxious about the beginning of school, about coronavirus, about the difficulties in our world today. Things in today's culture seem to absolutely overwhelm us. So many things from the stresses that little children even are feeling. I mean, did you hear that? In the children's message, little children are uncertain and worried about people who might get the virus. Children, the expectations in school from tests that they have to take, the expectations of teachers, the expectations of parents, whether or not they'll fit in in sports teams, and in circles of friends. And for older students, resume building, whether it's an application for college or whether it's an application for a job as you're looking at the end of college, whether it's the technology, if we're continuing to do virtual learning, or whether it's adjusting to being back in a building or adjusting to homeschooling, There are so many uncertainties in our world, and all of these things threaten to steal the peace and the joy that God desires for our life. You know, if there's one phrase that's repeated over and over again in Scripture, it is that phrase, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And yet it seems that our world is causing so much fear and anxiety in all of us. Sometimes I believe we might feel like the parakeet that I read about not too long ago. I read about this story in a local newspaper, one of those small town papers that like to pick up interesting stories about things happening in people's lives. It's about a woman and her parakeet whose name is Chippy. It seems that the woman was cleaning out Chippy's birdcage one day and she was using a canister vacuum cleaner. Now for those of you who don't know what a canister vacuum cleaner is, it's one of those vacuum cleaners that has a round little tub and a long metal hose attached to it. And on the end of that metal hose you can put different attachments to either clean your drapes or your furniture or get into corners in different places. Well, this woman decided she wasn't putting any attachments on the end of that long metal hose because she wanted to have a wide opening to clean out all of the bird seed in Chippy's cage. But as she was cleaning out Chippy's cage, her phone rang. So she turned her attention to answer the phone, and when she did, she heard the unmistakable sound of that vacuum cleaner hose sucking up little Chippy. In a panic... She drops her phone. She runs over to the canister of the vacuum cleaner. She pulls it open. She pulls out the vacuum cleaner bag and she rips it open. And there's little Chippy covered with dirt and soot. But he's alive. So she picks up little Chippy and she rushes him to the bathroom and she puts him in the sink and she pours water all over him to clean him up. And then she sees her hair dryer right there on her bathroom counter. And she takes the hair dryer and with all of that hot air, boom, she dries off little Chippy. Well, the newspaper picks up that story and a reporter calls her. 
And after questioning her about the incident and everything, he asked her, now how's little Chippy doing now? And the lady replies, well, he just kind of sits there now and stares. He doesn't sing anymore. You ever feel that way? Like life has just beaten you down so much? And there's so much going on that you don't understand? That you've lost your song. You've lost your joy. You've lost your peace in life. My friends, if we aren't careful in life, and if we aren't intentional in life, the stresses of life will rob our joy and steal our peace. We won't feel like singing anymore. We will take on the role of a survivor. My older sister, whenever you ask her how she's doing, her phrase is always, I'm hanging on. A survivor just hanging on to life. We are called by Christ to live an abundant life of joy and peace. That's why the admonition is in Scripture so many times to not be afraid, but to embrace this wonderful life that God has given to us, to live this life following the one who is known as the Prince of Peace. Because my friends, if we don't exude the peace of Christ in our lives, then all of those who do not follow Christ, who know that we call Christ the Prince of Peace, will wonder, is he really the Prince of Peace? If so, why don't you have peace? Why are you so anxious in the world today? In the epistle lesson that Austin read for us earlier, the Apostle Paul commands us very clearly, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. Anxiety, you see, magnifies our problems and minimizes our views of God, the God who created the universe, the God who holds our lives. The Greek word that is used here for anxious translate as distracted distracted by many things, illustrating the power of anxiety to take our minds and our thoughts off of the things of God, God's presence in our lives, and rob us of the blessings that are all around us. It prevents us from seeing God's presence at work in the world. Now the Apostle Paul who wrote this had many reasons to be anxious and so he was waving a cautionary flag to all of us, saying, I have learned how to be content despite all of the circumstances around me, and you can learn that too. The Apostle Paul wanted to warn us that we go down a dangerous path when we allow anxieties and worries to take over our minds. When our minds are monopolized with worry instead of consumed with God and God's graciousness and God's power and strength at work in our lives. And Paul tells us that the way to combat that anxiety overtaking us is to first make that conscious, intentional choice to no longer be anxious. Now I know that's much easier said than done. We might want to choose to let go of anxiety in this world, but it's difficult for us when so much is bombarding us all the time. So often we are like the young boy who was riding home on a church van one day after Sunday school. He was so proud of a little card that he had received in Sunday school. That little card had a picture and a little phrase on it, and the phrase said, have faith in God. He was holding on to that little card and looking at it when to his dismay, his fingers slipped and that little piece of paper just blew out of his hands out the open window of the van onto the street. And the little boy yelled out to the bus driver, Stop! Stop! I've lost my faith in God! The bus driver did stop. The little boy got out and he retrieved his little piece of paper. 
And one of the men on that church van made a comment about the innocence of little children. But another more mature man said, you know, we'd all be a lot better off if we were more concerned about losing our faith in God like that little boy is. You see, that's what happens when anxieties take hold in our lives. When we become under the stress of life, we have a tendency to not totally lose our faith in God, but to misplace it, just like Peter did when Jesus called him to walk on the water. He started looking at all of the storm around him and took his eyes off of Jesus. When we look at the stresses around us and take our eyes off of Christ, we become overwhelmed and we are in danger of losing our faith, our trust in God. Henry Ward Beecher once said, every day has two handles on it. And we choose which handle we will hold on to. We can hold on to the handle of anxiety or we can hold on to the handle of faith. You see, it really is a choice how we begin our day and how we live each moment of our day. Choosing to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Corey Ten Boone had a wonderful quote about facing the anxieties and challenges of life. She said, When I look around me at the world, I can get discouraged. When I look within me, I can get depressed. But when I look to God, I am at rest. What a beautiful quote. Looking to God will give us that peace and that rest amidst all of the circumstances in life. For as 1 Peter 4 reminds us, we can cast our anxieties, our cares upon God because God cares for us. You know, I'm told that in the British Navy, they have a strange custom. It's there when a sudden disaster happens aboard the ship that the still is blown. Now, this particular still is not a place where whiskey is made. This still is a whistle that calls out to all of the crew to take a moment of silence in the midst of the crisis that is going on board the ship. When the still is blown, the crew knows that they are to prepare to do the wise thing. Observers of that system note that the moment of calm in that moment when the still is blown and they become still has made all the difference. It has prevented many of a catastrophe, many of a scatterbrained instantaneous decision like the still that is blown in the British Navy. We are called to be still in the presence of God amidst the anxiousness of our world. And in many ways, that's exactly what you are doing today. You are coming into the stillness of this beautiful sanctuary, gathering with a community of faith, gathering amid these beautiful stained glass windows, hearing the great hymns of the church where you are reminded that you are not alone, but that God is your strength and your refuge. And that you are joined on your journey by other saints who are here to encourage you, to support you, to walk with you through whatever difficulties life brings your way. It is here that we baptize new members and that we share in the one loaf of bread and drink from the one cup of Holy Communion as we are called to remember to focus our attention on Christ who loves us and gave his life for us, to steady us as we move forward. And it is here that we are reminded of the power of prayer. As we read the Holy Scriptures, we regain our knowledge and our understanding that God has not left us alone in this world, but is continually reaching out to us, 
blessing us with resources and support that will help us weather any storm that comes our way. As we journey continually through this anxious world that we live in, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to make an intentional time in your life to read and to study God's Word so that you don't drift away from the truth that God is always with you. We need to do more than simply read the words of the Bible. We need to know the Bible. We need to know the God of our faith who is revealed to us in the Scriptures and that means meditating on the Scriptures and applying those values into our life so that as the Apostle Paul said, we can take on the mind of Christ, a mind that thinks of what is good and holy and pleasing and kind in this world, instead of being filled with the anxiousness, the anger, and the distress of this world. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. First, Make time each day to spend with God. Spend the first 10 minutes of every morning in God's presence. If you have a smartphone, you can pull up a wonderful app called YouVersion of the Bible. And there are lots of devotions on there that you can read. There's a verse of the day. You can meditate on just that one verse of the day. You can take notes and write your prayer thoughts, or you could listen to Christian music as you wake up in the beginning of the day. But begin that first 10 minutes in God's presence. Secondly, I want to encourage you to get involved in a Sunday school class or a small group right here in this wonderful congregation. I am so impressed with the number of Sunday school classes that are offered here at Washington Street. Sunday school classes of all types for whatever it is that you want to study, to get together with a group of fellow believers and wonderful teachers who can share with you and listen to your worries and your fears and pray with you and walk with you. The Apostle Paul reminds us so clearly that we can take on the mind of Christ. And one of the best ways to do that is to dig into God's holy word together. I want to leave you with a story from an old Cherokee legend. It's a story about a Cherokee grandfather who was teaching his grandson about life. And in one of the lessons, the grandfather sat close to the grandson and he said, Son, there is a fight going on inside of me and it's a terrible fight between two wolves. One is evil and he is called anger and envy, sorrow and regret, worry, anxiety, arrogance, self-pity. He is resentment and inferiority. He is lies and false pride. But there is another wolf that is good. And he is joy and peace and love and faith. He is generosity and empathy and benevolence. He is truth and compassion and faith. And this same fight, my dear grandson, is going on inside of you. And it's going on inside of every other person, too. The grandson thought about that for a moment, and then he asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? Which wolf will win? The grandfather queried back. He answered his grandson very simply, the wolf that will win is the one that you feed. May we feed our minds by feeding that good wolf within with the word of our Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen.